So last week, we were looking at the inspection of the lamb, that four-day period when the lambs were inspected before they were sacrificed, that they had to pass numerous tests and inspections, and how Christ was the fulfillment of that shadow in the way that he was tested, the way that he was inspected and found to be the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. And this morning, I just wanted to kind of continue that theme of how Christ embodies the Lamb, how he is the Lamb of God, and what it means. And also to look forward, because again, especially at this time of year, we focus on, and it's right, we focus on the death, the burial, and the resurrection, which is absolutely right, but it doesn't finish there. And I was thinking about this last night, and um, I was... I was looking for a word, I was, I was trying to think of a word when I was looking at what I felt the Lord wanted me to speak about in terms of the Lamb and thinking about how it, it's all Him, it's all of Him. So what does that make Him? What's the word I was trying to get hold of and I was thinking, is He sufficient? It's not wrong, but it wasn't quite there. And there was other words and it wasn't quite there and I just thought, well, just, just read the Bible. Just read the Bible. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. And it says, I think it's about four times, maybe five, worthy is the Lamb. And I thought, that's it. That's the word I was looking for. That's what it is. It's God's word, and it? God's word is always perfect. We ain't got a clue, have we, really, half the time. You just got to open up the word and listen to God, and he will show you. So it's worthy, and that's what I want us to think about a bit this morning, is worthy is the lamb, the lamb that was inspected, the lamb that was crucified, the lamb that rose again. He's worthy. So if we can start again back in Exodus chapter 12, I just wanted to speak a little bit first about Passover and first fruits. Passover and first fruits. Again, last week we saw the inspection of the lamb was so that that lamb would be worthy, in a sense, to be sacrificed on Passover. So again, I just want to re- read some scriptures this morning. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor are to take one according to the number of the persons in them, according to what each man shall eat. You are to divide the lamb. The lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on the lintel of the house in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until the morning. But whatever is left over until the morning, you shall burn with fire. Now we can just skip down to verse 16, where it's speaking of this festival. It's sometimes referred to as the festival of the Passover or the festival of unleavened bread. They encapsulate the same time period, that same week. And it says in verse 16, And on the first day... You shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them, except what must be eaten by every person that alone may be prepared by you. And then, if you can just go to verse 22, please. And it says in verse 22, 
and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, which is obviously the blood of the lambs, and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts, and none of you shall go outside of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. So it was the blood of the lamb on the door of the house that saved those who were in the house. As the last plague, the tenth of the plagues that fell on the Egyptians were going to bring the death of the firstborn sons. So, without exaggeration, you could preach just on this probably for the rest of your life and still be coming up with different things to say about it. So, just to brush over some things, because there's somewhere that I want to get to. The fulfillment of Christ in the Passover meal. And that whole week, essentially, there was so much to it. We've already spoken about some of the things this morning. That the bones of the lamb weren't broken, neither was Christ. There was nothing of the lamb that was to be left over until the morning. Signifying things like the empty tomb. What The tomb was empty. The morning of the resurrection. The lamb was spotless, as we've seen. Christ was spotless. Absolutely sinless. You can move on to unleavened bread and see things there. We don't have time really to speak about unleavened bread. But something that struck me about the Passover festival, and it's the same, I think, with all the feasts, if not most of them, and I've always wondered why it specifies when God commands Israel to partake in these feasts that no work is to be done, no labor, Back in verse 16, it says that on that first day and on that seventh day, no work at all shall be done on them. And I've always thought that that may be to do with, you know, just trusting in God for your provisions for that time, allowing for greater um, focus on God so that you're not distracted with your work while you're partaking in these times. And there may well be some truth in that. But ultimately, when I was thinking about it, I think what this is really showing is it's his work. When we're looking at the Passover and the sacrifice of the Lord, does he want any of our work? Does he want any of our efforts, any of our deeds? No, because it's all his. And this is something that is so important. If we're looking at salvation, the free gift of eternal life, how do we receive it? By anything that we do? Anything that we can say or contribute? No, no works at all. And that's what this first feast symbolizes and and looks forward to, is the sacrifice that the Lamb of God would lay himself down as. It's his work, none of our works. He doesn't want any of our works. He doesn't want our tears. He doesn't want our commitment. He doesn't want any of our deeds or works. It's all his work. He doesn't want our two bits. What can we put on that cross that would add to what he has done? What can we mix with his blood? It's his blood that paid for us, the imperishable blood that paid for us. Anything that we add to that, would it not contaminate it? No works. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, you were saved by grace Through faith and that not of yourself, it's not of works, it's a free gift of God. So that no man will boast. There are many things in the Passover that show us things about the relationship between what the Lord did for us on the cross, his work, and our response. And I'll come to our response a bit later at the end. Now when the Passover lambs, and I found this absolutely amazing as well. When the Passover lambs were being sacrificed on that day, on the 14th, if you remember last week, as Christ was entering Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, if you remember, on the colt, 
on the uh, on the donkey that had never been ridden and the crowds were putting down the palm branches and do you remember what they were saying blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord hosanna i was doing some reading this week the the Mishnah, the Talmud, they described the temple services at the time when Jesus was alive. So at the time when Jesus was sacrificed. And they describe it in detail. They recorded things meticulously. And apparently, as the lambs were being sacrificed in the temple, there were a set of psalms called the Hillel Psalms. The Hillel Psalms, it means praise psalms. Psalm 113 song psalm 114 115 116 117 and it finished on psalm 118 while the lambs were being sacrificed and when you come toward the end of psalm 118 it's where it is sung blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord and i just thought wow what a picture and if you think after they'd had the passover and christ instituted the lord's supper what does it say they did they went out and sung a hymn as he was going to Gethsemane where he would be arrested. And these things all come together and I, I, you can't even begin to list the ways that God worked and had the foresight and knew all these things that were going to happen. And um, to think that that's what the Jewish leaders and the priests were singing because also in that psalm is the stone that the builders refused has become the chief cornerstone. They sung that as they were sacrificing the Passover lambs and as Christ himself, our Passover lamb, was also about to be sacrificed. It's absolutely staggering. The scenes, if you could go back in time with the knowledge that we have now to go back and see what happened on that day. Absolutely staggering. And the things that it means for us brings me on to what I, something I'd like to mention about first fruits. First fruits. It's something that isn't spoken much about in the church. But essentially, this is what Resurrection Sunday should be. You had Passover on the 14th, unleavened bread on the 15th, and then you had first fruits on the, on the first original Passover on the 16th. That was the day that the Lord rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. That was the day of the resurrection which on that year happened to be the first day of the week on the Sunday, which is why we, the, the church in the West sticks to Resurrection Sunday. Now, first fruits, what it essentially was, and God told them in advance, when you get into the land flowing with milk and honey, bring the first of your fruits, the first of your produce, as an offering to the Lord. And so it was the first of their produce, the first of the harvest, it was things that were for the oil, the wine and the grain. And it was, to, it was being dedicated to the Lord. And it was the best of the harvest as well. So if you used to come holding, withholding what was the best, you kept that back and brought something else. Not acceptable. But the first fruit signified the rest of the harvest that was to come. It was the first of the harvest. So how is Christ the first fruits? Well, if he rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits, it shows he was the first to rise from the dead, meaning there would be more to follow. There would be a future harvest, so to speak. So just like Christ fulfilled the, sac um, the Passover, he fulfilled the first fruits, the first of the harvest, if that makes sense. Now, Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. And this is, again, we spoke a little bit about it earlier this morning. We've died with him, we'll be raised with him. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, we have no hope. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, It says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep, i.e. dead. 
For since by a man came death, sorry, but since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. And then Paul explains that. He says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. And we know that's all who believe. In Adam there is death. We're all descendants of Adam. We inherit the sin nature. We inherit the death that goes along with it. But in Christ is life. So all those who are in Christ shall be made alive. And then in verse 23 he says, But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. After that, those who are his at his coming. That's when the resurrection takes place. The rapture and the resurrection at his coming. Christ rose first. Those were with him. The rest of the harvest, so to speak, join him. We are raised with him. That's the significance of the first fruits. And there's so much more that goes along with it. Again, an example, I think, if you go back and read in Deuteronomy, and again, I just find these things amazing. The types and shadows in the Bible... The law stated that no tree, any fruit from a tree was not to be used as an offering of first fruits until its fourth year. It had to have been a three-year-old tree and then in the fourth year the fruits could be offered as a dedication as part of the first fruits. Now you think about it, how long was Christ's ministry? Three to three and a half years. It was in the fourth year of Christ's ministry that he was offered up as the first fruits. I was raised up, I beg your pardon, as the first fruits. And there's so much to it, there's so much death, and I, I would encourage you to study these things, go and read some of these things and see how the Lord worked these things out. It's absolutely mind blowing. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and like I said, we could go on and on, but there's so much to try and. Um, Try and pack in, I just wouldn't be able to do it justice. I almost think it'd been better to have started back a few weeks and built up to it in hindsight, but anyway, there you go. Now then, we saw again, going back to last week, the lamb was worthy. He passed the test, he passed the inspection. He was worthy to be offered as that sacrifice. He was worthy to be risen from the dead. The raising from the dead, it was a sign that God accepted that sacrifice. Because the Father accepted that sacrifice, raised him from the dead. And what other sense is he worthy? Because there is so much more to it than this. If you can turn to the end of the Bible, and this is often again where we leave it here, at this time of year, and we forget, so often forget to look forward. In Revelation chapter 5, and I just want to do a little bit of reading. Why is he worthy? The first question I would like to ask is why is he worthy? We understand about the passing of the inspections and the tests. Let's just start in verse 1. So, just to give a little bit of context. This is now John's vision. John has been taken in the spirit up into heaven and he is seeing the beginning of the day of the Lord in the spirit. He is seeing what is about to come on the world. But there's a, there appears to be an issue at the start. It says, and this is John, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. So we know that these seals and this scroll is of vital importance and John understands this because when no one is seen to be worthy to open it, it causes him to weep. This is highly significant. We know that this is important. 
Verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome, so as to open the book and its seven seals. These seals would be the judgments, the wrath that God will pour out on the earth in the very last days. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne, which will be his father. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. Why is he worthy? For thou wast slain and did purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. He is worthy because he was the lamb that was slain, who redeemed men from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He's worthy if you go back also because he is the lion that is from the tribe of Judah and the root of David. It had to happen that way. So he is found worthy in heaven. This is at least 2,000 years on now from when he was actually slain. And it says, if we go on, And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, might and honour, glory and blessing. So this is the risen, risen Lamb. He is worthy. What is he worthy to do? What has he been found worthy to do? He has been found worthy to open the seals. The Lamb opens the seals, every single one of them. When you go to Revelation chapter 6, he opens the first one all the way to the seventh one. And each seal brings wrath from God on this earth. And we think, when we think of Christ as the Lamb, as the sacrificial Lamb, we think of him just as that, as a, as, as a dead lamb, as an innocent lamb, as a, as a meek and humble lamb. And it's not wrong. But it doesn't stop there, does it? We've got to take the whole counsel of God. He is also the lamb that breaks the seals, that brings the wrath of God upon this planet. In that time of tribulation... Just to skip forward to chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seals. And then you move through the plagues, the wars, the famines, the earthquakes, the pestilence, the cosmic disturbances. All at the hands of the Lamb because he was worthy. It was the sin of the world like we saw that made it necessary that the lamb would lay his life down. But for those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, wrath is coming on this world and it comes at the hands of the lamb. But there is a purpose. It's not just punishment for the sake of punishment. There's also a purpose. We've read that the lamb is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. So what else is the Lamb worthy for? What is that describing? 
if we turn right to the end of the Bible. Chapter 21, Revelation 21. In between these chapters, God's wrath has come upon the earth in the tribulation. People have been saved. Israel, the nation of Israel, the remnant of Israel, come to salvation. Christ returns. Judgment with him. And he sets up his kingdom. He establishes his kingdom on this earth. And if I can just read another passage from Revelation. I just want to start in Revelation 5, 9. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. 21, 22. So now this is the new heavens and the new earth. All things have been made new. And in verse 22 it says, And I saw, this is John again in the Spirit, and I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. And the nation shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory to it. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night, its gates shall never be closed. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations to it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then into chapter 22 it says, And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming down from the throne of God and the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. And there shall no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his bondservants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. The Lamb is to receive the kingdom. He's to receive the kingdom. When Christ comes returns and sets up his kingdom on earth he'll bring justice he'll reign in righteousness all the promises in the old testament to israel will be fulfilled everything absolutely everything dealt with at the end of that period of a thousand years even death itself death and hades are thrown into the lake of fire and it says in 1 corinthians 15 that's the last enemy to be done away with death itself shall be done away with and then if you remember what follows on from there the son offers up the kingdom to the father that kingdom that he has established and created and performed all perfection in he hands it to his father and the new heavens and the new earth come and that's what we've just read there the new heavens and the new earth while Christ is on this earth reigning for a thousand years, he's on the throne of David. And I would just like you to turn your attention back to that last verse we read in chapter 22, verse 3. And there shall no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. The Lamb will share the Father's throne once again after all things have been done, after he has offered the kingdom, his kingdom, perfected to his father. He's glorified. He is glorified. He is the Lamb who will be glorified forever and ever to receive all the riches and honor and wisdom and power that we read in the end. He is not just the crucified, meek, humble Lamb slain for the sins of the world. He is the risen, glorified Lamb who will bring wrath, who will receive his kingdom, who will offer that kingdom to his Father and be glorified forever. 
this is our God, this is our Saviour. And if you have believed, if you have believed, he is your Saviour and he is my Saviour. And I just want to finish by saying, back in Exodus 12, the shedding of the blood of the Lamb alone wasn't enough to save anybody. The blood had to be applied to the door. Christ's sacrifice on the cross paid for the sins of the world. The Bible's clear on that. And there's a sense where even we can believe that. We can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge who he is and these kinds of things. But unless we apply it to ourselves by choice, unless we receive who he is, unless we receive the truth and receive that free gift of grace, that free gift of salvation, unless we apply the blood, that blood that was shed will have no effect for us. It's there and it's been done. But just like the Israelites and any Egyptian that was also in that house, whoever so applies the blood will be saved. And it's the same for each and every one of us. I'd just like to finish in prayer.